Hello and welcome to Keylingo Live. My name is Frederick Marx and I am your host. We really appreciate you joining us today. So what have you gotten yourself into? This is a live show from Keylingo that covers business topics. Uh, we've talked to lots of influencers in business and there's really something here for everyone. Uh, we're broadcasting live on LinkedIn where we're going to have a professional community of people logging in and we hope that you will engage with us. And that brings me to my first uh, question for the audience. We really would love for you to engage with us. So if you would, please just type in the chat where you're calling in from. And please continue to engage with us, keylingo.com, here on LinkedIn, YouTube, uh, et cetera, wherever you uh, interact uh, with social media. So what is this current series and episode about? We are doing a Keylingo Spotlight series called uh, Lessons from Leaders. And I have been interviewing CEOs from different industries. As you might know, uh, Keylingo is in the professional services space. We provide language services. But we have been talking to, to leaders from all lots of different industries, whether they uh, tech startups, uh, accounting firms, lots of different types of uh, industries. And today, this episode, I believe, is super special, and I think that you will too. This episode, we're going to be uh, interviewing a founder of a company that is the global leader in surf coaching. And that might sound like something uh, unusual to you. And we hope it does because surf coaching is something that you may not be familiar with that much, or you may have been to a beach where you have seen, um, I don't know, a small setup or some uh, companies or surf shops offering surf coaching. This is something different. Uh, we're going to be talking about a business today that has elevated the concept of surf coaching. And I'm going to leave that little teaser right there. And we're going to get into the first uh, audience engagement piece. And we're going to take uh, a quick poll before I introduce our guest today. And there it is. We're going to take a leadership quiz before I get into introducing our guest today. And while I'm introducing him, we'd like you to interact with this leadership quiz. You see the QR code there. And the poll is the most important quality in a leader. So please scan that QR code and, and tell us what you think is the most important quality in a leader. Now, let me introduce uh, our guest today. You may have seen it in the run-up to this uh, live episode. His name is Rue Hill, and he is the CEO of a company called Surf Simply that he founded in 2007 in Costa Rica. He grew up in the UK, actually, teaching surfing on Cornwall's no north coast, uh, teaching both entry-level surfers, all the way up to the, the British junior team. Uh, so he's got a broad array of experiences with regard to surf coaching. But what you're going to find out today in our conversation is that surf coaching is just a small piece of what Surf Simply has done and done so amazingly well. And so with that, I would like to bring in our guest today, Rue Hill, CEO of Surf Simply. Let's see if we can get him on the screen with us right now. All right. Hello, Rue. Hi, Frederick. It's really nice to be on, uh, on here with you today. It's great to see you as well. And I do just want to give a quick heads up to our audience that this is a live show. And we may experience some technical difficulties along the way, but don't worry. I think that they'll get worked out quickly. And uh, if the power goes out in Costa Rica during our conversation, don't, which is a distinct possibility, everything will be fine. We'll, we'll keep going. So let's take a look 
at what we've got uh, in our leadership quiz today. The most important quality in a leader. Let's check the results of that and see if we can't glean some insights. All right. What do we have here? My eyes. Uh, let's see. We've got uh, ability to listen and empathize is a small chunk there. And then charisma that lights up a room. And unfortunately, my picture is taking up the results of the last one. So maybe <laughs> one of my production team members can put that uh, that last one in the chat. OK, here we go. It's a little bit. OK. Vision that impress others. Is that what that says? Uh, inspires others. Uh, vision that inspires others. That was by far the most uh, important one. What do you think about that, Rue? Do you, do you agree with the results of the poll here that vision is the most important of those three aspects of leadership? You know, it's it, when, when having conversations like this around topics like business development and team building, it is always very tempting to boil things down to one thing. And I get asked quite a lot, like what, you know, what, what's the secret of the success? And the answer that I always give to people is, you know, it's 10,000 things all working right. It's a little bit like asking, you know, what's the secret to a Boeing 747 flying across the Atlantic? You know, it's like everything has to be working, all these little putts. Having said that, you know, I do think that your poll is is reflective of certainly one of the most important things. And it just reminds me, if you'll indulge me in a quick anecdote, that Please. when I was starting the business, and I'm sure this is, and, and incidentally, I'll try and make my comments like broadly applicable to all businesses. I'm not going to get too into the weeds of surfing. But when you first start a business, you have this idea in your head, this vision, and you're sort of trying to convince everyone that, that they can come with you on this journey and you're sort of dragging them along, like believe in my vision, you know? And if you're really lucky, you find one or two people that get it, that get the concept and believe in it. And suddenly it's like they get out of the cart that you're pulling and they come around the front and they help you, they help wow. you pull it, you know? And there's a certain point in the, in the business, if, again, if you're really lucky and you find good people and you, you articulate your vision clearly to them, that suddenly there's more people pulling than there are sitting in the cart needing to be pulled. And at that point, you have this, this really wonderful change in the culture, where as a, as a CEO, you can sort of sit back and let the incremental improvements that happen in your business come from your team rather than being top down, which is emotionally much more sustainable over the years and the decades. And it feels really wonderful. And I think the analogy that I always like for that tipping point is, you know how, you know, if there's a if there's a costume party at Halloween, right? You know, everyone comes along in a costume, or if there's not a costume party and the one person that does turn up, right? It's not that it's it's not that it's an awful thing, but as human beings, it's so hard baked into us to want to conform with the people whose opinions we care about with our social group. And yeah. if you can build a culture where people really believe in the dream, once you get over that tipping point, once more people are pulling the cart than sitting in it, then when new people come in. They just get infected with that culture in a positive way and that enthusiasm and a desire to do everything really well. And I feel like it can be so hard just to get over that over that hill. But when you're on the other side, it's it's immensely rewarding. So that that was slightly longer answer than you probably no. were expecting. But that was my no. thoughts on that one. That was an incredible uh, uh, answer. And those remarks were awesome and I love the metaphor of the cart and and folks getting out of the cart and helping you pull that's an incredible metaphor and I think that that's um, I hope the audience sees right away you're able as a CEO to really articulate these concepts that can be quite complex in a way that that really makes sense and so I really appreciate once again you joining us today and helping me uh, and helping our audience think through some of these big concepts in entrepreneurship, in leadership, in growth, et cetera. And the first question that I want to get into is, is around your approach to life and business. And I want to give the audience right away, um, can you give us a glimpse into what Surf Simply is all about and the values that drive the company? Um, yes. Yeah, so 
if I let me spend a minute just painting a picture of Surf Simply as a business model to people who aren't familiar with it, and may, maybe it'll make a bit more sense as to why you've been gracious enough to ask me to come and speak with you today. So um, I started Surf Simply out the back of my car in 2007 because I was really interested in surf coaching. And very specifically, I was very interested in the fact that while entry level surf coaching was fairly ubiquitous, and actually, although a lot of people aren't aware of this, elite level coaching is fairly widespread too. There's really no surf coaching for the 98% of people that are in between beginner and advanced. And um, there's very little confidence from the public in surf schools and surf coaching uh, businesses to provide them with coaching of value because so many people have had the experience of going along as an intermediate level surfer and just being told to stand up and then the coach kind of shrugging their shoulders and saying, well, you're on your own now. So I became fascinated with this project of connecting the line from beginner to expert in a methodological coaching system. Um, so that was kind of the, the first, that was the ori original idea why I started Surf Simply. I moved to Costa Rica just because I wanted to be able to operate the business year round because year round income meant that I could pay my coaching team year round, which means, mm -hmm. you know, the best and brightest who could really do anything they wanted to could justify making a career out of surf coaching. Wow. It takes three or four years to train someone as a surf coach. And so if you're losing people because they can't sustain a, a seasonal job every few years, you're sort of on this treadmill and you never get off it. So right. that, was, that was why I did the move to Costa Rica. Fast forward 15 years and it's gone from my car to a store space and then we had a, a smaller resort and then we've moved to a higher end resort. Although, as we can talk about later, we haven't expanded. We've stayed small. We just have 12 people a week. Um, and now we have this beautiful building designed by Gensler, who, who designed Google's building and various other things, sitting right by the beach in Costa Rica. We, we only have our 12 people per week. We're quite high end, so we charge nearly $9,000 for a week of coaching with us. Um, we get full about 12 months in advance. And on any given week, we have a waiting list of about four or 500 people, uh, which isn't to say a different four or 500 people. You know, people will put sure. themselves on the waiting list for multiple weeks. So we've had every opportunity to expand in the conventional sense, but we've chosen to stay small and to try and be really good at what we do and stay with our team that we have now, which is 35 people and stay at that size. Um, yeah, anyway, that's a little bit of a, that's a bit of a yeah. version of, of what Surf Simply is. No, that's, a, that's great. And I hope that the audience is getting a, a glimpse into this distinction between, you know, a, a going and renting a board or, or hiring a coach for a day at, you know, any number of beaches around the world and what your offering is. Uh, as you can see, I'm wearing my Surf Simply t-shirt. I have been a customer and I guess you can now call me an evangelist for, for Surf Simply. It's an incredible thing that you have created. And I was so honored to be there. It was actually a gift from my wife for our 25th wedding anniversary. My wife doesn't surf, so I went alone. And it was- Oh, I didn't uh, know that. That's so cool. Yeah, it, it was, uh, I think the next time I come that she will come too, but I think we need to save up a few years before we can go again. But I mean, the price was well worth it. Uh, and it was, it was life changing for me. And I, once again, I just like to point out to the audience that this is an incredible business. It is not, you know, uh, sort of a passion project or a lifestyle, although you guys do lead amazing lifestyles, this is a, a, a very uh, important business in every sense of the word. And before we get too deep into the questions, and in case, you know, people are here on Friday and need to hop in and hop out, we do like to have a section of the show where we just play a little game together where I answer, where I ask you some rapid fire questions and you just give me some quick, short answers that I think that the audience will uh, get some interesting insights from. Okay, Rue, here we go. When I was a kid, I wanted to grow up and be? Um, I wanted to be various things, but um, I remember that when I saw Top Gun, I wanted to be a pilot. And then I saw <laughs> Cocktail and I wanted to be a bartender, which I did for a while. It was a lot of fun. And I think although I'm embarrassed to admit this, I think I saw Point Break and was like surfing, you know? Mm, I don't know if that's aging me well or poorly, but um, <laughs> it's, it's so funny in life how 
you get into things for the most random of reasons and then the stuff that actually is really rewarding wasn't what you were aiming for in the first place and is often the shiny thing in the corner of your eye rather than the thing you're aiming at. One of the greatest movies of all time, The Bodhisattva. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. Best piece of advice you've ever received? Um, you know, I, I think the best bit of advice was from a guy called Stephen Novella who said that you shouldn't die on the hill of any one opinion on a particular topic. The only thing that you want to really hold on to is I'm going to be consistent in my logic and I'm going to be open to evidence, open to information. That's the only, that's the only hill I'm going to stick my flag in and that's the only hill I'm going to die on. And then, you know, you can change your opinions and you can say I was wrong about this and I, can wrong, I was wrong about that because this is the, all the information I had at the time or this hole in my logic hadn't been pointed out to me. And you're never really wrong. Yeah, you know what I mean? You're just, yeah, you're yeah, just yeah. learning and, and it's a good way of sidestepping the ego when you're, um, when you're wrong about things. So I'm not very good at the short answers. I have a little ADHD. No, it's fine. And I, I feel the need to expand on that one as well, because I, I follow an individual on LinkedIn that I find very, very insightful. His name's Adam Grant. And he, he participated in a podcast recently where he talked about the difference between beliefs and values uh, and he said that the values were much was what you think are is important and obviously beliefs are what you believe but if you uh think that curiosity is an important value i think it it speaks to what you were talking about that you might not hold on to any one particular opinion but you'll be open to being persuaded and and open to hearing other people's points of view so um i think i think that's a great perspective all right, next question. In high school, I was voted most likely to? Um, bizarrely, I was voted most likely to be a painter, to be an artist. I actually went to Chelsea College of Fine Art in London and, and did uh, a year of, of painting, figurative painting. And then I decided to take a year out and do some surfing. And I guess technically I'm on my 25th or 30th year out at the moment. Wow. Amazing. I had not, I did not know that detail that you were an artist, but looking I, at the I, building. I'll, I'll share something with you actually just very interesting quickly, which is the whole, a, a large part of the methodology for surfing was based on my experience at art college. I had this incredible teacher called Leonard Green. And he said to me, you know, you guys are 20, you have nothing interesting to say to the world really. So don't try and tell your story. Just, just learn how to use, you know, paint and learn how to use a camera and learn how to use clay and metal and wood and then when you're older and you want to express yourself you'll have the skills to do so and when I came to surf coaching um, surfing is this very abstract you know some people call it an art rather than a sport and it's very you know expressive um, and what's good and bad surfing can be subjective and I took that same way of approaching it and I was like all right let's just teach people how to use the tools of a surfboard and create speed on a wave let's teach them the practicalities of the mechanics and once they have the, sc the skills, they can go and express themselves in the same way. So um, that time at art college was incredibly informative as to how Surf Simile actually ended up evolving. Wow, that, that's super interesting. Thank you so much. If you could be someone else for a day, who would you be? That's, that's a tough one. We have a lot of incredibly successful people come through Surf Simile. And there's honestly not there's not any, I know this sounds kind of pretentious, but there's not anyone I'd actually want to swap lives with. I really, I'm very lucky. Um, you know, I, I would love to, I'd love to uh, perform on stage. I'm an awful musician, but I would love to be a good musician for a day. So I could, I could be on stage. That'd be great. Awesome. If, if I were to have, if you were to have asked me that question, definitely. I'd love to trade lives with Kelly Slater one day on a big day at Ooh. Pipeline. And just yes. and just paddle out and have people just leave leave waves for me and and know how to just uh, be in control in that organized chaos that is that beautiful place in the world. Oh, so, very great. Yeah, you know, I'm changing my answer to what you said. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, if I could go back in time, I would change. Well, I mean, you know, the the classic wisdom is that you shouldn't change anything because it would change who you are now. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I will say nothing derails somewhat an entrepreneur, a business owner in their thirties and forties than a divorce, you know, the emotional financial toll that it takes on you, um, making a smart relationship decision early on in life 
impacts your business so much. It's the most wow. important decision you'll make is the person who your partner is. Mm-hmm. I've, my friends would say that I've made some questionable relationship decisions over the years, <laughs> but um, I've learned from them and the business has done okay. So I guess I wouldn't change anything. That's awesome. And I will tell you that my choice in partner has been instrumental in uh, my business success personally. And, and I, I just think that having somebody there that I, when I present an idea and I, and I do that a lot and, and she has no problem saying that that's just dumb. And, you know, you, and you have that, you have somebody there that's not afraid to kind of, because they're going down this path with you um, that, uh, that's a, that's an important sounding board to have. So I agree a hundred percent. You're getting advice audience, not only on business itself, but in areas outside of business as well. Very <laughs> useful. So biggest surprise, last question in this rapid fire group, biggest surprise you've ever encountered in life is. I mean, maybe this is kind of a slow burn of a surprise. Um, and again, it sounds a little bit cheesy, but this really is true. Uh, and I think it's true for a lot of business owners. When I started Surf Simply, I was looking for the same things that most people who start businesses are, which is economic security, uh, some degree of status, you know, which we pretend perhaps that we don't want, but we all really need is baked into us as humans. Um, And what I didn't think I was going to care about so much was just all of the people that I've actually got to know and have, have, have dedicated their adult professional lives to this Surf Simply project. And I started the business and then I, I, you know, I hired the people to make the business work. And now that whole thing is kind of flipped around the other way where the project of Surf Simply is very much about creating a life for the people I really care about, the people that I work with. So I didn't see that one coming. And it's, yeah, it's one of the nicest things in life. That's, that's so amazing that you said that because that one also really resonates with me. I've been in business now for 20 years and there was a point in time when I was more focused on you know, delivering the best service that we could. But over time, my purpose really started to evolve around uh, creating a better life for the people that work in the business. And we actually have a documented purpose that's called improving people's lives. When we say, what business are we in? We say, we're in the life improvement business, not in the language services business. So yeah, I agree. And, and I- yeah, and I think it's really important. And I just, for any members of the audience that are now rolling their eyes going, how are these two guys telling, telling each other how great they are improving lives? I, I, I think it's useful to say that having that approach is incredibly selfish because it's, mm. and it, again, it's, it, it sounds kind of silly, but um, there's a huge amount of research. There's a fascinating guy called Robert Waldinger, who's an author who's actually run the longest studying longest running scientific study ever, which is based out of Harvard. And it's tracked 200 people. You may be familiar with it. 200 people from Harvard, 200 people from Boston. And it looks at the metrics that make for a good life measured in all the different ways that you can measure a good life from health, criminality, um, self-reported happiness, longevity of relationships, etc. And they were looking for what's what what leaps up above the noise in the data as being something that correlates with a good life. And the one thing was the quality of the relationships that you had with the people you spend the most time with. And interestingly, it didn't matter so much whether people were married or whether they had kids um, Mm -hmm. or how many friends they had. It was how good those relationships are with the people you spend the most time with. And mostly the people you spend the most time with are the people that you work with. And so just, you know, if you're the, the most ruthless, logical, scientifically literate person, it's a really smart strategy to have great relationships with the people you work with. It's gonna have the biggest cash value of almost any investment you make in your life. That is uh, so incredible. And I am very familiar with that study, by the way. And uh, uh, it, it's, it's incredible. So um, thank you so much for those uh, remarks, Rue. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this, but 27 minutes have already flown by in our conversation <laughs> today. And we're going to we're going to uh, close things out around 45 minutes. And so I really want to get to some of these uh, really important questions that we have here for the audience and, and for you to discuss with them and provide insights. And so let's let's tackle this one and then we're going to uh, move on to the leadership in motion section for the production team. Uh, how would you describe your approach to life and how does it align with your business values, Rue? Um, well, to, to, 
to talk on from kind of that, that Robert Waldinger study, you know, I think that I, I made, so my father passed away from cancer about 10 years ago and it was a very interesting experience. I was, you know, sitting right there with him and I was suddenly aware that I was remembered being, you know, him at my age. And then I'd sort of seen him all the way to the end. And I was like, oh, wow, that's the whole thing. I've seen the whole thing from start to finish. Um, and I, at that moment, I suddenly was struck by how I was on this treadmill that I see so many really smart people on where you start this process of trying to gain economic security and status and professional accolades. And you get so used to the process that you forget to just get off the treadmill and go, so where am I going again? And, <laughs> you know, and it, it was around that point that I was like, all right, I'm getting pretty close to a comfortable level of economic security. And while there's a lot of research that does actually show that more money does make you happier, it also is diminishing returns and it kind of yes. like, you know, it, it levels off. At, I mean, the classic figure is 70,000, although I think that's out of date and it's probably more like double that now. But, um, you know, I, I realized, OK, I'm sort of getting to the top of that diminishing returns graph. What else is really important? And I decided I wanted to have a place that I worked where I had good relationships with people and they had good relationships with each other. And, that, you know, I, I, as their boss, was going to see it as my role to remove obstacles from their path so that they could be the best professional version of themselves. The analogy I always use for a boss is you should be like Alfred to Batman. You know, you should be the guy that makes the Batman, make sure the Batmobile's tires are pumped up, make sure it's all good so Batman can go and be the best version of yeah. himself. Um, so I made that. I made that the priority for my business. And of course, it still has to make money. Otherwise, it's a hobby, not a right. business. Um, but yeah, I made that a priority and I, and I, you know, more than half the team have been at Surf Simply for 10 years, which is, you know, significantly more than the average tenure at most businesses. And, you know, I feel like I have good relationships with everyone. I mean, you might have to ask them, but I, I you know, I think we do and they do with each other. Um, and I think that it's a better business as a result. I mean, the most common thing that people say at the end of the week is, there's this really wonderful shared culture where everyone's really proud of what they do and trying to be the best they can at what they do. And, and I think that's an emergent property of me making that decision to prioritize um, how well they all got on with each other and therefore supported each other. Yeah. It's so important what you're, what you're talking about. And I, and I hope the, the audience is just soaking up all of these pearls of wisdom uh, that you're sharing, Rue. And um, I would like to just remind everyone that you can interact with Surf Simply in lots of different places, but primarily their website, surfsimply.com. They also have an amazing uh, Instagram feed, which I learned yesterday grew significantly in recent years because of the attention of one of your amazing people there at, at Surf Simply. So check them out on Instagram. Uh, you also have a lot of helpful tutorials on YouTube. So I hope that everyone in the audience takes note to, to interact with Surf Simply and, and check them out in, in, in greater detail. So let's move on. And I want to talk about this next section in our conversation today. And I want to hear from you because you've talked a lot about relationships and the importance of relationships in a successful business. Who were some of the instrumental people in making Surf Simply the success it is today? Um, well, uh, so some of the, I mean, just to, to name drop a few people who put a, who put a huge amount of work into making it what it is. Jesse Carnes, who you met when you were down and her husband, Will. Um, Harry, who is one of my oldest friends and is our coaching director. And um, I think he, he and I were probably the original surf nerds, you know, if for, for your audience that interact with Surf Simply, the one thing you'll notice is there's a distinct lack of coolness. We're all very nerdy and geeky about surfing, mm -hmm. which is something we've lent into. Um, and Daniela Acosta, who was one of my, who, one of the first people I gave equity to, which we can talk about in a moment, but she's, she manages the whole hotel side of the business. Mm -hmm. Callum Morse was someone else. He, as you mentioned, he grew our Instagram in the last four years, just as an example, from 5,000 people to 170,000 people without spending a single penny on advertising. We actually haven't spent any money on advertising since 2018. And we've, we've, I, I decided to take that money and invest it in people instead and just put out lots of great content. And 
for members of your audience who who you know dive into the surf simply stuff online you'll see there's lots of free stuff that we're giving away in terms of information and um you know that's always been my attitude with uh with our presence online so callum's been huge as well and of course derek who who yeah. you were talking about earlier and one of the, one of the other coaches um yeah i could run down the list of lots of people sure. but i, I won't know <laughs> yeah no i know that um uh for for the audience to know i I, I think I mentioned it earlier that I, I have been to Surf Simply and, and I'm an evangelist today. I just think you're doing amazing things. And it was clear to me during my time there that the people that you named and, and, and more uh, really have just invested their full selves into what you're, what you're doing there. And that is a, a great segue into my next question. Uh, this is about you know, how you've recognized those instrumental people at Surf Simply in terms of equity ownership. And for the audience, before um, Rue gets into this, you should know, you know, I'm a business owner too. Um, there's probably some uh, folks in the audience that are entrepreneurs and business owners. Uh, Rue and has a particular philosophy about this that I think is very valuable. So, so listen up. So yeah, the, the way that I approached giving equity to members of the team. It, I'm not aware that it's been done anywhere else. And I'm happy to admit that it's an experiment, but it's an experiment which I feel really good about at the moment. Um, so, you know, traditionally in business, the, the model is something like you want people to feel inspired to do the best they can for your business. So you give them some equity, but those that equity takes time to vest and they have to reach certain markers or be with you a certain length of time. So the, the equity serves as a motivator. That's the idea. And I've always been suspicious of that model. Um, I'm really interested in behavioral sciences. I mean, I'm not a professional, just an enthusiastic amateur. And there's a lot of research which shows that motivating people to do work when it's a very short task that doesn't require multiple steps, creative thinking, and a lot of personal relationships works quite well. So for example, this is the classic study. If you pay people, you know, certain number of cents to put stamps on an envelope, people will work a lot better if they're being paid per stamp than if they're being paid per hour. If you want people to do long, complicated tasks that really involves the creative thinking part of their brain, once they're engaged with that task, they're not holding in their mind the whole time, oh, I want to get that extra bonus. It's like you, you just can't hold all of that in a human brain at one time. And so you kind of shut down and you just get on with doing your t the task. And my hypothesis has been, you know, I think that people really either do a fantastic job or they don't do a fantastic job. And I've never had success saying, look, if I give you more money, will you do a better job? Um, so what I've tried to do instead is if people do a great job and there are you know, lots of other things you can do that are non-financial to help people be the best version of themselves professionally. But if they do a great job, then I, of course, fall over myself to pay them as well as they can, as well as I can, so that they don't leave and go and do a great job somewhere else. But I thought I never want to I never want to have pay that's, that's like motivational pay. It should always be rewarding rather than motivational. So I was thinking about that in terms of equity and none of the equity that I've given away to members of the team is conditional. It's it's always been you've already done you've you've already increased the value of the business by what you've given by at least the amount of equity that i'm giving you so this is yours and you own it and you deserve it and you built it and you know i give people and i say to them you know when they sign it uh, when they sign the papers i'm like i can never take this away from you you know this this is yours um the bricks and mortar of the building the business the whole thing and um it's not just about the money because there's, there's no money directly attached to the equity. People get paid what they get paid and I pay everyone as much as, as, much as the business can. Um, they'll get a realization of that if we ever sell, which right. I have no plans to at the moment. But what's really important is that those people can now go home to their family, to their friends and say, yeah, I own this. You know, I didn't just work there. I, I'm one of the owners. And I think that that, that is such an important thing, you know? Yeah. It's it's an incredible thing, and uh, I appreciate you sharing those details. That 
you know, a lot of CEOs might not be willing to to share that level of detail about their cap table. And, and I think that it's, it's very, very interesting. And by the way, please don't sell the business for a very long, <laughs> a very long time. I, I think that, um, you know, the, the people at the business make uh, surf simply and uh, that that's incredible. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, as you were talking, I was thinking about, oh my gosh, is he planning on exiting sometime soon? Uh, which you probably oh, could yeah. at any point that you wanted to, but I'm, I'm glad to hear that that's not on the roadmap at this time. All right. We are, I think we got about seven minutes left to go Rue, in this conversation and we're seeing some, some great feedback from folks. And let's see that next question from the production team here. The fact that people around the world keep coming back, and, and this I wrote this question. It's very intriguing to me. Um, I actually put a post on LinkedIn, and I know that you're not active on LinkedIn, but I but the the title of the of the post is was Can a business be perfect? And I, I, I wrote down several things, you know, based on my training in business and my experience, things that I think would be characteristic of a quote unquote perfect business. And I think that Surf simply qualifies in a lot of respects. And the fact that you have repeat and referral business is one of those characteristics. What do you think makes Surf simply such a compelling place uh, that people want to continue to come back to it? Well, I so, you know, at the end of each week, people do an interview for a little weekly movie that we make as a sort of a souvenir to take home. And yes. people honestly talk about a lot of different things. They talk about the surf coaching, which I, I think we are unique in the world in that we have a team of coaches offering, you know, a, a, a system which is uniform. Um, but then they talk about the people as well, and they talk about the resort experience and all of these things. And it's difficult to, to put a, to the pin in one thing, but I, I think the takeaway that I've taken from it is we've always had this attitude of just incremental improvement. And I think in the world of business and in the world of podcasts and conversations like this about business, it, again, it's always very tempting that people want to have their one champion thesis which is maybe the central theme of their book that they're selling or whatever um and you know actually usually the reality is a lot messier than that so mm -hmm. what i would argue for is incrementalism just incremental improvements you know and and that's something we try and do the goal at surf simile is that every week we have like lots of meetings back of house between all the different teams and and we're like hey well what about if you know we we make the muffins you know, on three days a week so that they're always fresh before the morning surf. You know, what about if we switch cameras to these ones? Because then we can slow the footage down a bit better when we're doing, you know, all these tiny little details that we try and get better week on week. And the thing I'm most proud of is that when people come back, they're always like, hey, we didn't, we thought it was good last year. And then you did this and this and this. And like, we never even <laughs> thought of that. And that's really cool. And that's part of the reason actually why I've chosen not to expand the business because I find the project of incremental improvement so fun and rewarding. And for me personally, nothing that there's, there's nothing wrong with this for other people, but for me personally, the thought of just trying to you know, freeze it all and then duplicate it across different locations just isn't as intellectually interesting or as, or as emotionally rewarding. Yeah, I'm so glad that you brought that up because I actually mentioned it in my testimonial video uh, by the way, if people want to see my week at Surf Simply, it was April 22nd through the 29th, 2023. And um, I was super happy that um, I was asked to give a testimonial video. And at the end of the video, um, I mentioned that I had overheard a conversation between you and another participant at, uh, at Surf Simply. And the question was, around why don't you have surf simplies all over the world uh, because you've created such an amazing experience and there's a lot of amazing waves and 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 uh, environments around the world that it seems like you could replicate it and i thought that your response was just super fascinating and and i think you just said well that just doesn't sound fun <laughs> I, I thought I thought it was the best response you could have given to that question. But what was a contradiction to me is that entrepreneurs are 
we're often distracted by shiny things and we're often hardwired for for scale for growth it's just something that's that's built into us as entrepreneurs we want to make things bigger but you have made this conscious decision to to not do that and make what you have built better incrementally and that is that is a, a very difficult thing uh, to do as entrepreneurs. It reminds me of a book, actually, uh, a book called Small Giants. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's a book about companies that have had the opportunity to grow and chose not to. And I think that there's a huge lesson for entrepreneurs out there that growth for the sake of growth isn't the best path. And I think that your your business is evidence of that. Yeah, a few people have recommended that book to me. I haven't yet read it, but I will now after this conversation. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's a great read. Um, folks, we are getting to the end of our time together. It's Friday and I want uh, people to be able to, to head to lunch or whatever time it is where, where you're coming to us from. I want to remind everybody to check out uh, Surf Simply, uh, their website, surfsimply.com, their Instagram, uh, YouTube. There's so many helpful uh, tips out there. Even if you're not a passionate surfer, I think there's some interesting um, things for just general business people to see. Like, what does a what does a professional website look like? What does uh, what do uh, tutorial videos uh, uh, look like? And Surf Simply has done an amazing job at all of those things. And before we get into our closing, I do think that we have one more. Uh, piece of engagement that we want to put on the screen as a close. I think the production team might have that uh, available. And while they get that, Rue, I am going to uh, just freestyle here uh, and um, ask you a question uh, because running, running a business is inherently stressful at times. And I wanted to ask you in moments of stress, how do you maintain your motivation and resilience? Uh, I'll try and give you three point answer as quick as I can. So the first thing is, uh, I, I actually have started doing a mindfulness meditation practice the last few years. Uh, I'm a big fan of Sam Harris and his waking up app because it's secular and it doesn't have lots of what I think of as sort of waffly stuff in there, you know, but sort of woo, you know. Right. So I really like that. And I, and I really do think it's important. I say that as a very scientifically skeptical person. It really is. Um, you know, I think the second thing is creating a work environment where people don't think they're going to get blindsided with criticism. Whenever there's a problem, we have a rule that you just do whatever it takes to solve the problem. And then you write down the problem so that you can have a conversation later about building a system so that problem doesn't come at you again. And that way you completely sidestep the need for blaming anyone. And no one's walking around work feeling like they might at any moment get blindsided with being called out on some mistake they've made. Um, you awesome. know, I think those, I, you know, I'll leave it at that. I think those are, I can see the clock ticking and I think those are, those are probably two of the big ones. No, that's great. That's great. So let's take a look. I hope people scanned that QR code and uh, we have some results to, to take a look at. And this was, how do you inject passion into your work? And we have the majority of people uh, stay, saying that constantly learning and seeking growth opportunities outweighs setting exciting goals, uh, finding meaning and purpose, and nobody selected collaborating with inspire, inspiring colleagues. So <laughs> <laughs> uh, constantly learning. Uh, I think that's something that you would embrace, right, right Rue? You're, you're constantly looking for these incremental improvements and, and learning. And, and what do you think about the results there? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I honestly, I think all of those things are really important. And um, I guess as a final thought, something which isn't included there, and I think everyone's always reluctant to talk about, and I've mentioned a few times, and that's status. And we tend to think of status as being having a money and a, and a money and a flashy car and all that kind of stuff. Um, and we tend to think of ourselves as having stepped out of the status game if we decide to move to Costa Rica and get rid of all that stuff and spend our time surfing. 
But actually, you just step into a different status game with a different group where now status is about perhaps how little you value monetary possessions and how much you value time in the water. Yes. And uh, one of, uh, a, a guy that I've got to know recently is an author called Will Storr who wrote a fabulous book called Status Games. And I would recommend that to all of your, your viewers if you're someone that runs a team because realizing that people in your team need status, the positive kind of status, um, mm -hmm. as much as everyone needs oxygen and how to give it to them and the fact that you can, um, that, I, that's a bit of wisdom that I've learned in recent years and I would, I would pass on and encourage your viewers to, to find out more about. Absolutely. Status games. I'm sure the production team is writing that down as we speak. Rue, we are out of time and I can't tell you how special these few minutes with you have been for me. You're you are an incredible ambassador for surfing, for entrepreneurship, for having leading one's uh, best life. And I hope that the audience saw that here. And we provided some small forum for you to uh, get your ideas and your, your thoughts out into the world because they really need to be out in the world. I spent a week at Surf Simply. I didn't get a chance to interact with you that much, but just seeing what you've built, what you've created, the people that you have inspired, um, you're, you've, you've done some really amazing things. And, and uh, I couldn't be happier for your success. And I hope we have an opportunity to speak again soon. But thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. I really enjoyed our conversation. And thank you for indulging me in, in waffling on about some of the stuff that I find really interesting. I really appreciate your time. Well, you're welcome. Thank you, audience, for being with us. And uh, we will see you on the next Keylingo Live episode. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.